Welcome everyone and uh, thank you for joining us today for this panel. I don't think this topic needs a lot of introduction. Uh, it's probably one of the hottest topics nowadays. We're all aware of the benefits and the risks associated with AI. AI is also part of the theme of this year's CPDP. And the question now is, of course, how do we deal with those risks and how do we gain those benefits and how can we use regulation as a tool for that? Um, we've all been aware of the promise made by President von der Leyen of the European Commission that within the first 100 days, there would be a legislative proposal on the table. Now, we know that this will not be a legislative proposal anymore, but at least a white paper for discussion. Some of you might have already seen that white paper. Um, but besides the European Commission's initiative, there are of course many other initiatives that are attempting to show, either through soft law or hard law initiatives, how we should govern AI. And with governing, we really want to focus on not only tackling the risks, uh, so safeguarding regulation, regulation in a broader sense, but also enabling, because regulation can of course be used as an enabling power as well. Um, we have a great lineup today, um, and I'll be your moderator, Nathalie Smuha. I am a researcher at the KU Leuven, and I used to be the coordinator of the High Level Expert Group, where Fanny Hidvegi, our first panelist, uh, is a member of. Fanny is Europe Policy Manager at Access Now. Our second panelist is Norberto Andrade, Privacy and Public, Man Public Policy Manager at Facebook. Our third panelist, you have the privilege to see her here, because she didn't upload her picture, is Stephanie Rossello, researcher at the Center for IT and IP Law of the KU Leuven. And then lastly, we have Gabriele Mazzini, legal and policy officer at DigiConnect, not DigiJust, of the European Commission. So we have a great mix of industry, academia, civil society, and commission here. Before we start, let me just uh, give an explanation of how the panel will work. I'll ask each panelist to give some introductory statements of a few minutes. We'll then have a discussion amongst panelists, and then I'll ensure we have sufficient time to open it up to the audience for questions. Fanny? Thank you very much. Um, welcome, everyone. My name is Fanny. I'm the European Policy Manager at Texas Now, indeed. And uh, Natalie and I had the chance to spend a lot of time together at the High Level Expert Group One on AI. Um, and uh, I think uh, it's important to say that I'm a human rights lawyer. Uh, I'm not a technologist, so that's my that's my approach to this uh, topic as well. Access Now, for those of you who are not familiar with our organization. We are a civil society, non-profit NGO. Uh, in, we work internationally at the intersection of human rights and technology. I'm based in Brussels. And in addition to our pretty broad mission of working on privacy, data protection, cybersecurity, network discrimination, AI, and more, I actually have much cooler colleagues than myself, who is a lobbyist and a policy person, because we operate a 24-7 digital security helpline. So if you face any digital security threat, you can reach out to Access Now's helpline. It's available in 11 languages, and you get a response in three hours. And uh, some of you already know that we organize a conference called RightsCon, which will be in Costa Rica this time. I, I, uh, well, I encourage everyone to come as we want European voices to be represented there. Personally, it's my seventh CPDP, actually. And I remember that one of the early years, we had a data retention panel, uh, which I was on because we, was lit we were litigating the national implementation of the data retention rules. And Joris von Hoboken asked the question about the member state competence in data retention. And funnily enough, the opening event of CPDP was still about this subject matter. So going back to the title of this panel, what is good AI governance and how do we get there? I don't know all the answers, but one thing is for sure, not in 100 days. And so that would be my first message uh, to hold, hold the horses. And um, what, what I would recommend as a starting point, that instead of quote-unquote artificial intelligence, let's talk about automated decision-making systems instead for two reasons. One, AI in itself as a term is misleading because when we pack everything under this umbrella term. We talk about everything and nothing at the same time. You could easily replace 
AI to big data in every single panel conversation we have uh, at this event. Uh, and uh, a funny anecdote that we always talk about is in the 50s when, when the whole work started and there was the Dartmouth workshop, the researchers were actually debating to use this term or use something like complex information, uh, information uh, processing. And they decided to use AI for fundraising purposes. So I urge all the lawmakers that instead of the hype around AI, try to think of complex information processing and try to approach if you're still that encouraged to get something out the door just because you want to do something. The second reason why we should focus on a automated decision making, because this should be about a governance question indeed, as the, as the panel suggests. How in a democrat democratic society we require decisions to be made. It should not try to catch a technology which is evolving anyways. We should try to catch how decisions are being made either in the public sector or in the, in the private. In terms of four key global recommendations, because we organize our work that we have a global agreed position, one of the, one of the key element is that we believe that we need a comprehensive data protection and privacy reform. And as much as, we, as much as we are happy with the general data protection regulation and we think that it's a success story, the work is not done. We need much more, much more cases, much more clarity on what the right to object mean, will mean, for instance, or explanation. We need to conclude the e-privacy reform. Excuse my French, but we can talk all about the bullshit of AI-related protections when we don't have basic online privacy protections in Europe. What, what is going to help us in this space? Then we need to focus on enforcement in the privacy and data protection field. The second, and that is part of the white paper as well, the mandatory human rights impact assessment will be a crucial question. And we see all these risk-based approaches without defining the criteria, what is high risk, what is low risk. And that is a circular conversation because sometimes in order to assess whether your application or sector is indeed high risk, you actually need some kind of impact assessment. So that is definitely an area that we need further work on. The liability point is crucial in the white paper and elsewhere. And I would like to point to the Council of Europe uh, recommendations where it just clearly says that in, in any single matter, liability should lie with specific natural or legal persons about the decisions and not to um, hide behind a technology, uh, technological solution. So these are the baseline recommendations. And then in the conversation, I would be happy to talk more about the EU-specific ones. OK, thank you very much, Fanny. I heard a lot of interesting things that I would love to ask further questions about. But that will be for later. Norberto, please. Thank you. Uh, good morning. Uh, as Natalie mentioned, my name is Norbert Andrad. I'm a privacy and public policy manager at Facebook. I'm based in uh, Menlo Park, where uh, Facebook's headquarters are located. And I work and have the opportunity on a daily basis to work directly with engineers and product managers. So I get to see the, the technology in the, in the making. And then I also establish a kind of a bridge between the engineering world and the external policy world by uh, reaching out to influential stakeholders to get their feedback on some of the products that, and features that we're building and bringing that feedback back to the, to the headquarters. Um, I would like to thank you for your presence. There's a lot of interesting panels on AI happening at this, at this moment, so thanks for, for choosing us. We hope uh, we will make it worth it. Um, I, don't, I don't know how many times I've been to CPDP, probably seven as well, uh, and I've been here wearing different hats. It started, I think, maybe in the first or second edition as a, as a, a PhD student where I was presenting a paper in the Pecha Kucha format that I don't know if it's still happens, but that was quite fun. Uh, I've been also here as a member of the European Commission when I work for the Joint Research Center, and for the past couple of years, uh, Facebook has been organizing panels, and we did one actually last year also on the topic of, of AI. For my introductory remarks, um, I will touch upon two different angles of uh, AI governance, uh, one that I would call the, the internal one, 
Uh, I think that AI good governance should start at home, so I will give you some, some examples of how we at Facebook um, implement ethics in practice when it comes to building, reviewing and deploying AI systems, and then I'll give you some insights into how Facebook is thinking and approaching AI governance and, uh, and regulation. So starting uh, with, with internal uh, perspective, and this is very related to, to the work that I do, um, it, it's important to uh, take a very pragmatic and applied ethics perspective here. So let me give you a couple of, of ideas around processes and tools that we use to actually build AI in a responsible uh, way. And it starts with actually the review process that we have in place. I'm part of a, a review team. Uh, it's called our privacy program, where we sit with uh, product managers and engineers even before they start coding to discuss the features and the models that they want to, to build. It's a cross-functional uh, process, iterative. It starts at the ideation phase, and it, and it uh, relies on feedback from external stakeholders. Regarding AI, there are important moments in that review process that we'll just briefly touch upon. One would be data selection, the other would be data annotation, and the third would be fairness assessment. So we have concrete phases during that review process where we discuss um, what kind of model um, are we planning to, to train and deploy, what is the purpose of that model, and what kind of data as a data training set we actually need for that uh, specific model. So we have um, very detailed discussions around what kind of data should be granted to the engineers to uh, build those, those models, and the data selection is very important for us to start actually mitigating for an intended bias that might creep into those, uh, those models. So making sure, for example, in those conversations that we are tackling the issue of representativeness of the data set and the quality of the data set is uh, very, very important. Moving from data selection, we also um, have important discussions around data annotation. Um, some of our uh, machine learning models are, are supervised models that, that need to be labeled and, and annotated. Uh, imagine, for example, a machine learning classifier that is built to detect uh, hate speech. You actually need ground truth. You need a data training set that is composed of actual instances of, of content that is uh, hate speech. And for that, you need to label that data. For that purpose, we actually have a dedicated team that drafts um, guidelines for annotators to make sure that we have a consistency uh, throughout the whole process. Uh, one of the issues of bias might come from the annotation itself. If you have different perspectives or different assumptions regarding the data set that you are asked to annotate, and if there is no consistency, then you might be leaking your own bias into that, that data set. So it's important to have a team that oversees that um, that process and drafts guidelines in a uniformized way that are going to be given to, uh, to annotators. And those guidelines are actually approved by, by the review team that I'm, that I'm part of. So you can do a really good job at actually selecting the, the, the data set, at making sure that the annotations are uh, consistent, but there still might be the risk of, um, of bias that AI might be learning or even propagating. So for that purpose, we need to actually have also a fairness assessment phase during the, the review that I've just been t telling you about. And for that purpose, we have a tool that we actually developed with uh, the help of um, influential academics in the algorithmic fairness community, a tool that we call uh, Fairness Flow. And this is a tool that is available to machine learning engineers at Facebook where they can actually measure the fairness of their algorithms according to a growing number of different uh, metrics or parameters. Two of them are the diversity of the data training set, so actually the Fairness Flow the, um, shows a, a sort of x-ray of the data set. It shows what subgroups of people are represented in that data set by uh, gender, by age, or location. And it then uh, calculates how that algorithm is performing across each of those subgroups. So it can actually tell the machine learning engineer if that specific algorithm is performing better for men than for women, for example. So that's an, an important phase, an important tool. Um, so these are a couple of examples of, of tools and processes that we, that we have in, in place. There are other examples around explainability and, and transparency that I might have the opportunity later on to, to tell you about. I would just like to finish my introductory remarks by giving you a, a couple of bullet point uh, insights in, into, how bullet see, into how we see um, uh, algorithmic uh, regulation. Um, 
uh, a year ago, we had a very important call for regulators and governments to actually set the rules for the internet in uh, key areas like election integrity, uh, privacy, uh, harmful content or data portability. And we mentioned also that in terms of privacy, it's important to have clear rules for uh, the application of those rules in new and emerging technologies like artificial intelligence. Uh, we believe that AI uh, poses important challenges to existing uh, regulatory uh, frameworks and it's important to, um, to understand the right calibration of regulation in terms of level and scope for artificial intelligence. So a couple of, of bullet points that, that we think are important when it comes uh, to approaching AI regulation. We believe that it should depart from a lot of the things that we already have, uh, EU legislation, but also industry uh, best practices. Uh, we believe they should be uh, risk-based and, and focusing uh, on the most sensitive type of AI applications and, and sectors. It should be evidence-based, and here I will talk a little bit more, uh, at, at another opportunity about um, regulatory sandbox and other pilot uh, policy prototyping programs that we can use to actually test regulatory, different regulatory propositions. We also need to think holistically and think how laws and regulations should interplay and be coordinated with other governance uh, instruments um, like self or co-regulatory uh, approaches. And it should be definitely informed by stakeholder engagement and consultation like the EU uh, has been doing um, so far. So I leave you with, with those uh, very bullet point uh, notes on AI regulation and hopefully we'll, I'll have the opportunity to uh, expand on some of them. Thank you, Norberto. I am sure we will have the opportunity to dive further into those things. Stephanie, not the seventh time that you are at CPDP, but uh, welcome for the first time. Can you give your introductory statements? I'm not sure. Is the micro working? Yes. Um, good morning, everybody. Indeed, not, uh, not the seventh time. It's the first time for me. So it's a good opportunity, a wonderful opportunity to be here and to speak about this topic. Um, I'll first briefly say uh, why I'm sitting here. I'm a research assistant at the uh, Center for IT and IP Law at the KU Leuven, uh, part of the law faculty of the university. Um, there, I've been confronted uh, since last year where I started working at the university uh, with the topic of AI and its impacts on the law in uh, different ways. The most important ones are two. First of all, I've been assigned to a project, an H2020 project, uh, which is uh, called Musketeer, which is still very much up and running. It started last year. And this, that is aimed at the development of a machine learning platform that uses privacy preserving technologies um, for very different reasons. Uh, the two objectives, the two use cases that are being tested in the project are uh, the healthcare uh, one, so the machine learning tool will um, help doctors in early diagnosis of uh, prostate cancer, and the second one is predictive maintenance in a smart manufacturing um, scenario. So this is uh, the first way in which I've been uh, challenged in my legal and, and ethical role to think about uh, the impact of AI on existing legislation. Um, what discrepancies are there, if there are any, and how they should be tackled. Um, a second one is through uh, my involvement, the center's involvement in the um, Center for Data and Society, which is a newly launched center by the Flemish uh, government that uh, groups uh, several universities at the, at the Flemish level. Uh, so it's our center, the Center for IT and IP Law, that is represented there together with colleagues at uh, Smit VUB and colleagues at Ghent. Um, and there we are in charge of um, not so much doing research about the topic, but more looking at what is already out there in terms terms of international legal instruments or ethical instruments on AI and attempt to translate them to um, more concrete guidelines for different stakeholders, uh, policymakers, uh, the civil society more in general, the wider public, and uh, the third ones are businesses that uh, deploy and develop and use AI in their daily practices. Um, so now I think I've already consumed two or three minutes of the seven minutes that I've been allotted. I, uh, I have a background as a lawyer, I will be short and to the point, on the topic of, uh, of AI governance. Um, I will give you an answer that has 
for mainly four elements. Um, what does AI governance look like to me? Um, first of all, I think we need a binding legal framework as opposed to ethics. Why? Uh, ethics is a good starting point and I think uh, we have already gone a long, long way into that direction. There have already been many initiatives at European level, at private sector level, uh, well, with, uh, uh, with, with, with industries uh, setting their own ethical charters, but we also need um, actionable rights. We need something that can be enforced, enforced in front of a court of law. Um, so, first of all, we need a binding legal framework. Uh, second of all, I think the binding legal framework, and this has already been addressed by the previous speakers, uh, and I agree very much in, to that extent, uh, should rely on already existing legislation. Um, we should not forget that there is already a rich body of EU legislation and legislation at the national level that does already, to a certain extent, cover certain uses in certain sectors and certain effects of um, AI technologies. Um, so this should be our starting point where to look, to look at. Third element of the answer is that the legal framework should target not that much AI technologies, because um, as this has already been, been mentioned by, by Fanny, um, AI technology means everything and nothing. Uh, what is AI? It's an umbrella term that covers very many different applications, uh, different uses in different sectors. Um, I think we should start from an effect-based um, based approach. We should try to target with regulation what the effects of AI are, both in, in a negative, uh, negative sense, to damage control, and positive, try to, to, to maximize the benefits that it can, an AI can have have for individuals and for humanity. Um, and the fourth element I think that is essential uh, for creating a good uh, governance framework of AI is to focus and to reshift the debate from the technology itself to the human behind the technology. Uh, we need to foster a culture of human accountability. It's in the end humans that can make decisions as to what is right and what is wrong. Um, and um, I think this should be the underlying thread that guides regulators when uh, considering to revise the existing legal framework on AI or create additional rules on AI. Thank you very much, that was clear. Um, Gabriele, we know you will not be able to tell us in details what the European Commission is currently envisaging in terms of AI regulation, but what can you share with us? Hi, hello everybody. Um, so my name is Gabriele Mazzini and I work at DG Connect at the Commission. Um, so I've been doing work on AI about the last couple of years. Uh, before that I was in DG Just, uh, actually my name before was associated with DigiJest, but now since a couple of months I'm in DigiConnect. Um, before that I was uh, working in other institutions, was working in the Parliament, um, the Court of Justice, but I also had, took some time off from Brussels and uh, I spent eight years in the US working in the private sector. Um, so I'm fairly new uh, compared to my other co-panelists on the work on technology and law, uh, but it has been uh, covered very intense years, I have to say, at the Commission. And, and indeed, uh, times are still very intense, as, as you can imagine. Um, so what I want to do today is uh, basically try to capture a couple of key messages from uh, the work of the past commission. Um, I apologize if I won't be able to go into detail of what's happening now, because indeed this is very topical um, time for us, and uh, a lot of discussions are taking place, which uh, unfortunately I cannot comment on. Uh, but I, th I think for the purpose of our discussion, it's going to be helpful to see where we're coming from. Um, and so the Commission, policy-wise, has been involved in AI in, I would say, the last couple of years. And the first communication on AI was issued in, um, in April 2018, the communication on AI for Europe, where um, the Commission sort of highlighted a, a three-pronged approach on what could be AI policymaking. And uh, first, um, the goal, so three main goals. The main, one goal would be to sort of boost the technological uh, research and, and development of AI, also from the perspective of industry, and facilitate the uptake. Um, the second goal would be to prepare for socioeconomic changes that are gonna be 
brought about by, by AI. And the third component uh, was about developing an appropriate uh, ethical and legal framework. So this communication also launched the work of the high-level expert group, uh, which was uh, facilitated by Natalie and where Fanny is, is sitting. And, and I, I'm not the best person to comment on this work. I mean, we have better people to do that, so I, I, I leave it to them in, in case that is needed. But essentially, this group has been doing uh, an incredible amount of work in a very tight time frame and has already produced two major uh, deliverables, so the ethic guidelines and uh, policy and investment recommendations for the commission. Um, what I wanted to say uh, as regards the legal and ethical framework for AI, um, essentially two main points. Um, the first one is that since the beginning, the Commission has um, inaugurated, or maybe not uh, in the sense that many other people have done that, but, but I have the impression that at least the emphasis has been stronger uh, from the side of the Commission than other global actors on um, essentially promoting a approach to technology based on values. Um, so the communication anchors very clearly um, the, any legal or ethical development on AI to a set of um, what we call values, which in the end are legal and the political principles that are enshrined in the, in the treaties of the EU, notably in Article 2. And then they are put together in terms of like the civil, uh, social, um, um, personal, political, economic liberties in the Charter of the Fundamental Rights. And so there is this um, very key and close anchoring of any work on AI to the um, fundamental rights, uh, to so-called European values. President von der Leyen in her speech to the European Parliament talks about our European way uh, when it comes to uh, digital technologies. Um, and, and the belief is that uh, so new technologies should be based on values, and it's only a value-based approach that essentially will enable a, 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 sustainable, uh, um, a sustainable sort of use and development of the technology. Um, there are already growing concerns about certain use and application of, of AI, but in general, perhaps also of other technologies, and the belief that this is not a race to the bottom or the belief that this is not a race to be uh, completed um, like in a 100 meters race, but more on a longer term uh, project which requires perhaps more thoughtful thinking at the beginning. Um, so uh, that I think is one, one key message. Um, and then another key message is the, um, the fact that as was mentioned by the previous speaker, um, AI is not something that is completely unregulated. Um, first of all, indeed, um, as also was mentioned, one has to uh, understand and one has to agree on what is AI, what is not AI. But the point also is that uh, in EU law, as well as in, 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 in a lot of um, laws of the member states, um, there is a large amount of legislation that directly or indirectly will impact the way this technology is developed. Um, so, for instance, if you talk about data so privacy and, or, or data protection, so AI is a way, is an algorithm that processes data. So the processing of data when it comes to personal data has to be done in compliance with GDPR. We can discuss whether it's enough or not enough, needs to be amended, not amended, but that's certainly a legal framework that is there and it applies. When, when you talk about, for instance, AI that is embedded in robotics applications, so there is a large amount of legislation that covers the safety of products, um, including engineered products. Uh, and the, the key piece of legislation is the machinery directive. The machinery directive covers tons of robots, of, of industrial machinery. So this legislation applies also to machinery that becomes embedded with software that is powered by AI. Again, the question is, is this um, sort of legal framework uh, sufficient or large enough to encompass the risks that are created by AI? It's, a, it's certainly a reflection that is ongoing. 
but the fact that this framework is there means that uh, indeed this framework also applies. And as you may know, judges eventually, when they come to us, uh, to sort of adjudicate issues, they 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 will look at what is out there. Um, so I'll I'll leave it here for now. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you all of you for these introductory remarks. I think we had a lot on our plate that we can now dig into. I think first of all, great news. Everyone seems to agree on so many things in this panel. There is already a legislative framework and we need to build further on that. It needs to be risk-based. It needs to be values-based. It needs to be human-centered. And I just want to go a little bit deeper. Let's make this panel a bit more juicy by looking at where the differences lie. Because I think if we go to a level of concreteness further, which we need to do at this stage, I mean, we're no longer at the stage that we say there is a legislative framework and there are legal gaps. We know there are gaps, we know there are challenges. Every one of you has mentioned that. What do we now concretely do about that? So I'm gonna ask all of you to briefly comment on First of all, what is your absolute priority? I mean, we've probably all seen the leaked white paper. There are a lot of things mentioned in there. But I would like to know if there is one thing, because 100 days is not a long time. And we know that in 100 days, you cannot have a comprehensive framework. But I'm not asking you what does a comprehensive framework looks like. I'm asking you if there is one priority that you can get through now, through parliament and council, what would you focus on? If you tell me high-risk applications, I would like you to specify how do you actually assess what a high-risk application is. And I would like you to also explain to me what the enforcement mechanism would be for your priority. So I'm sorry to be strict, but I think it would be nice to get a bit more concrete on the elements that we heard today. Fanny, you want to have a first go? Yes, and um, I, will, I will point to a difference for sure. Um, because I think the first priority is uh, is is very concrete and it's a, it's about enforcement it's also pointing about something that is already there and it's not about the future it's not about gaps in the future but the european commission at least in this uh, at least in the white paper talks about the two main pillars investment and the regulatory framework and there's no link whatsoever between those two. And already now, I would like to point to an op-ed that was published by Daniel Lufer and Fika Janssen maybe yesterday about how the European Union is currently funding dystopian artificial intelligence projects from the Horizon 2020 uh, framework, which has uh, so far around 80 billion euro and it will be increased. And... Uh, or existing laws and ethics guidelines even are not met. We see all these eye border control examples and others, and uh, the basic transparency requirements, documents are not published. I just don't have any confidence that if uh, the European Commission and other actors are failing, are failing to meet those requirements as of today, why would they develop different requirements for the future? Everybody is saying as a priority the ban on facial recognition. While I agree that that technology in the public space should be banned, we are missing the point when we are not talking about biometrics more broadly and privacy-invasive privacy business models more broadly. So my first priority is don't do anything in 100 days. That's against all of, all of your better regulation principles. Of, Maybe, maybe start enforcing existing laws that you're already failing at. How could we make this enforcement better of these existing Don't laws? Don't give money to, to projects that are violating human rights, or not even human rights, just rights. Norberto? Um, so in terms of, of priority, I, I, would, I would start by... Um, understanding the impact of this technology on the existing regulatory framework. I think, it's, I think it's, it's crucial to understand, and this is what the literature calls the, the, the pacing problem, what are the actual gaps between the technological advancements and the mechanisms that are intent to regulate them? Where, where do we see those gaps? How do they actually manifest in practice, and what are the, the concrete measures that one should take to, uh, to mitigate them. So just 
just an example, if you're thinking about a, a regulatory framework to promote uh, traffic safety, you obviously need to take into account that no, not only humans will be able to drive cars in the future. So that's, a, that's an important element that needs to be part of that uh, revised regulatory framework if you want to be serious about it. Um, but then, if, if you actually look at um, application of, of, of labor laws to, um, uh, you need to take into account that self-driving trucks probably should not be stopped uh, for hours during a day because of labor law. So, so this is an example of, of concrete gaps that might manifest and might uh, be raised when you have some technological advancements that have not been taken into account by the existing regulatory framework. So my, my, my first suggestion and priority would be to do a serious study of what exactly are the gaps that we are um, mitigating uh, for. Then, uh, secondly, and we talk about this, is, is really to not reinvent the, the wheel and understand where the existing regulation can already be applicable and can, how can you make it more, even more compatible with the technology at, uh, um, at hand. The, the second thing, and coming also to my, to my bullet points uh, uh, that, that I listed previously, is to take into account this, uh, having a holistic perspective of, on the broad sense of, of regulation understanding how can other stakeholders that are uh, also grappling with, with AI and with the challenges that they pose and what instruments and what processes they have come, uh, that they have uh, implemented in terms of industry best practices or uh, principles, uh, recommendations, uh, strategies, uh, standards, certification programs, codes of conduct. How can all of those instruments actually be aligned with a legislative strategy? How can we make them actually mutually reinforcing and not have this um, continuation of the debate around a binary option, either, uh, for, like, like was mentioned uh, by Stephanie, either binding or, or ethical? I, I think that they actually can be mutually reinforcing, and there's a lot of work that could be done in actually making those ethical frameworks more compatible or at least with some more concrete linkages to existing laws or to existing uh, legal terms. So I, I would make them more uh, mutually uh, um, reinforcing than actually feeding into the binary uh, debate. No, so I'll leave can it I just pick up on that? So I think what I hear from you is as a priority there should be a sort of mapping of the gaps uh, between the, the risks that we see and the existing legal frameworks. And that's an exercise that the Commission is currently undertaking, that many groups are undertaking. And you've given us some very nice examples of how Facebook already does basically its own job at reviewing and having processes and compliance processes in place and try to meet at least the sort of ethical side of things to which law can be complementary. So my question now is to you in light of the mapping exercises that are taking place, are there already areas where you feel today that there should be a legislative approach in addition to the existing ethical tools that you have? I mean, there are other companies, uh, Apple, Microsoft, Google, this week, who actually, you know, in the news made the headlines for wanting regulation. Is there something where you see that need already well, today? Obviously, and I'm, I'm not dismissing the need for regulation at all. What I'm saying is that regulation should not create this abrupt uh, uh, gap between what has been done and what, what companies and other stakeholders or other institutional organizations have been doing that can inform the legislation strategy. Mm -hmm. So the, the, the ethical guidelines actually point to, to legislation. The, the OECD recommendation on AI and its principles, if they would follow what happened previously and historically with, with the privacy guidelines, will actually inform legislation and would contribute to the global alignment of, of practices around uh, regulation of, of AI. So my, my important point is that uh, ethics can, uh, can inform good mm -hmm. laws, can help, so they can come before laws, they can help when you have laws in terms of their interpretation, and also importantly, they can complement um, existing laws. So they're, uh, and, and it's part of, of, of the legislation um, nature, it's impossible to cover everything, um, and, it, and, and there are risks of being overly prescriptive, so there's an important role of actually mm. people that uh, are addressed by those laws to actually complement them by having their own Finding ethical the right reviews practices. Yeah. The other thing that I would mention is very importantly, another priority is to be absolutely clear about what is the strategy around the risk assessment methodology. I think this is a very important and rich field right now in the AI governance debate. We already have some 
uh, more concrete ideas around risk assessment, not coming only from, um, from the leaked white paper, but also from the German Data Ethics uh, report that has also presented its own uh, views around risk assessment methodology. So it's important to actually come up with a taxonomy of, of concerns, of risks, but more importantly, and this was mentioned uh, by Stephanie, and I, and I totally agree, is when you do that risk assessment methodology, you should take into account not only the concerns, the risks, but also the benefits and the opportunities. That should be part of the equation. I don't want to, to be the blue sky optimistic around AI, but there are truly applications of AI that can contribute to reducing inequality and discrimination. There are uh, AI applications that can actually contribute to uh, human autonomy. We should also take that into account and maximize those benefits, and that should definitely be part of the equ equation when we talk about risk okay, assessment methodologies. Thank you. Stephanie, can I hear your priority as concrete as possible? And you're, of course, welcome to comment on any of the things you already heard. Yes, so um, I think in line with what was said by, um, by Fanny, I think my first priority would be to take a step back. And um, in 100 days, uh, having a legislative framework in place, revising a legislative framework on such a sophisticated and, and, and difficult and challenging topic is, is in, in, my, in my view, very, very um, challenging and, and, um, and difficult. Um, I already addressed in my introductory speech that um, to me the most logical steps to undertake would be to do two type of mappings, as has already been mentioned also. Uh, explore the state of the art of the technology. So what is AI? Which sector is it being used? Uh, for which purposes are we using it? Huh? Because a Spotify algorithm that tells me which music I'm going to listen to is not the same algorithm that is going to be used in a machine learning tool that will assist physicians in the detection of diseases. Um, and um, try to understand which type of technology is not already, already out there, but is going to be there in the foreseeable future. Should we worry about AGI? Well, if I listen to what experts tell, maybe not in the foreseeable future, maybe not in the coming five or 10 years. So do this mapping with respect to the technology. Once you've done the mapping with respect to the technology, do the mapping with respect to the law. Check to which extent we already have at the EU level, but a lot is also governed with respect to liability, contractual liability. And, and, and tort liability at the national level, check to which extent um, some things are already covered. Um, for example, and this has already been mentioned, the general data protection regulation uh, covers one of the most debated um, uh, AI technologies uh, the last months, which is facial recognition technology. There have already been two cases last year, at least two cases, uh, one related to the data protection uh, authority in Sweden, where facial recognition technology has been challenged in in light of the principles of the GDPR. Another one in the UK where facial recognition technology has been challenged in light of um, Article 8 of the European Court of Human Rights and uh, the Data Protection Act in the UK. Uh, to borrow an example from uh, my competition law colleagues um, uh, who in the framework of AI have been analyzing the effects of pricing algorithms on the markets, um, we do, we have already had decisions uh, that have been, where these algorithms have been tackled on the basis of already existing legislation, Article 101 of the, of the Treaty on the Function of the European Union. And I'm referring to the decision of uh, um, the UK Data Protection, the UK uh, um, uh, Competition Authority and uh, Commission decisions. Uh, there was a decision in the poster case, uh, um, online poster sales, and then other decisions by the, by the Commission in 2008 so these are only very limited examples and I'm more familiar of course with the ones related to data protection but it, it requires us to, to really do this extensive mapping and I understand that the Commission is already is already doing this uh, uh, to a certain extent so I would say this is the way to go uh, good thinking um, now when you have to address uh, which priorities uh, when you have to set a list of priorities and you have to address which topics you're going to uh, to tackle first, I would be guided by um, three main elements. Uh, Natalie, you already mentioned this, uh, and they are also mentioned in the uh, leaked white paper of the commission. Um, one is high-risk applications. How do you determine what is high-risk and what is not? Um, well, very, very down-to-earth. What is going to 
have an impact on someone's life or not? What is going to have an impact or cause a physical injury to somebody? This, this could be very, very down to earth and concrete criteria that can be used. Um, um, another, another principle, uh, another element that I would consider is um, do not reinvent the wheel, as I said. Um, start from what is already there. So uh, uh, the, the fundamental layer for um, a good performing artificial intelligence tools is um, uh, data. Uh, we have the GDPR with respect to personal data protection. But as I'm seeing in the context of, of my work, the GDPR is still very much unclear on very very many basic concepts. Um, uh, for example, what is personal data? We have um, a, an opinion of the Article 29 Working Party that dates from 2007. Uh, this opinion is being contradicted to a certain extent by an opinion of 2011, which is in its turn also a bit in contradiction with the ECG Breyer case of 2016, which all of all three instruments, actually all three, all, all three sources, relate to the previous data protection directive. So, if we can already have clear guidelines, ex ante guidelines by the authorities in charge, so the EDPB or the National Data Protection Authorities that are maybe sector-based and standard-based also. Personal data used in scientific research, medical research, for example. This would already help, and it would not only help AI, but it would help also other big data-based applications. But it's, it's an easy, it's a quick win that I think would, would, would already bring us a step, a step further. Um, I think I will leave it like this for the moment. All thank right, you. thank you, Stephanie. So we're hearing partly the commission is actually already doing what it should be doing. So starting with this mapping exercise rather than rushing. So I guess that's good news. On the other hand, there are many open questions still in the air. How do you interpret certain things? What are the elements that should be prioritized? So I don't know, Gabriele, could you give your stance on this? Um, yeah, so I think I've heard a lot of um, ideas one can certainly share. Um, I mean, I picked up on the question of enforcement and, um, and I think there, for instance, indeed the GDPR is, is a key piece of legislation that is there and it's, and to some extent, you know, while there may be some shortcomings in terms of, you know, what certain provisions could mean or not, on the other hand, it's actually, to me, an, an impressive overall um, regulatory system that not only relies on a pretty detailed regulation, which is for sick very complex, but also on this additional guidance by the uh, data protection authorities, which in my view is, is a key element. I mean, this leads not necessarily to the question about co-regulation, which was mentioned by, for instance, by Norberto before, but, but I think, you know, when, when you talk about AI, I think, um, and, and about sort of a comprehensive regulatory approach, uh, or a regulatory approach, let, let's say, uh, I think, one of the complicated questions is how to find the right balance between what you want to put in the law and what is actually you, you may want to leave outside of the law. Um, and I think in a way the, the GDPR with this whole system of data protection authorities that have been working on, on personal data protection for many, many years already um, although perhaps not perfect, and we will see, because I think there is, there is an evaluation of GDPR which is coming up this May. And I think this is going to be a very interesting, I hope, um, um, evaluation which will suggest the extent to which GDPR may be already addressing some of the questions that we're discussing today. I mean, it's true that, uh, you know, no one knows, or, well, it's, it's debatable whether the automated decision-making provisions on GDPR solely automated is, is, you know, covers only a machine making decision or a, a decision made by a human based, for instance, on an inexistent oversight by a machine. So these are questions that are still open for debate and where the Data Protection Board have, have uh, issued their own opinion. And I think it would be interesting to see how this is applied in practice, you know, and eventually the courts will decide. So I don't know, I don't, I don't think I have very clear answer in terms of priorities, but, uh, but I do think that uh, indeed looking at enforcement as it stands now based on existing legislation is a key element. And the mapping, indeed the Commission is doing it, um, is key. And myself I've been sort of studying on my own personal capacity a little bit this intersection between AI and existing law and I've realized that 
there are very complicated questions in each subfield of the law. So liability cr raises some questions. Consumer protection raises some other questions. Um, data protection raises some other questions. But in the end, they're all raised by very similar uh, technological advances. So the, how do you square the circle in making sure mm -hmm. that you, you sort of come up with a sensible regulation of certain uses and application, and at the same time, making the right connection with what is already there, which will continue to apply, but maybe need some, some tweaks yeah. here and there. Okay, I think Fanny, you would like to, yeah? I have a question. How many of you have read this 18 page long white paper? Because we're talking about it as if it was Shakespeare or some other mandatory reading material for this conference. And, and, and I think we are referring to it as if it was common knowledge. So I thought I would spend like two minutes on telling what the five regulatory options the European Commission is considering if, I don't know, yes, yes, okay. So the white paper has two main pillars. One of them is about investment, uptake, and boosting AI in Europe. The other one is about regulatory framework. Again, the t two are not linked to each other in my opinion. And then the regulatory framework has a specific chapter on data access. And the Commission's strategy will have a big data strategy, data access, personal and non-personal data. And then finally the paper talks about these five regulatory options. And those five options first, a voluntary labeling scheme for the trustworthy ethics guidelines, which would not be binding on the way we understand binding laws, uh, but it's discarded at least in the white paper. The second one is a consideration for public authorities and facial recognition in particular, and a three to five year long potential ban on facial recognition in, the pub in public spaces. The paper in its last sentence, unlike the reporting on it, concludes that this is, as of, as of that paper's conclusion, not the preferred option. Then the third is about mandatory risk-based uh, requirements for high-risk applications and to uh, define high risk either based on sectors or based on applications. The sector sectors would be exhaustive list, like healthcare, for instance, uh, to define them from the outset, the applications would be more uh, evolving. Fourth, safety and liability. That's where the most concrete outcome of the white paper you can find to include software in the definition for, for the existing framework, which was not the case before. And finally, the governance structure for whatever AI regulation or different uh, solutions the Commission will uh, do which depicts a combined approach to have some kind of horizontal law enforced by the new body and also uh, leave the existing national member state authorities to enforce the rights that they were set up to. Let's say a discrimination case should be decided by an equality body and not a quote-unquote AI body. Sorry, I just thought that maybe it's good to, good to flesh out what's in that paper and not assuming that everybody yeah. Is. Thank you very much, Fanny. That was very helpful. Um, we are starting to run out of our discussion time because I want to make sure there is enough time left for uh, audience questions. But I would like to do a quick last round and ask each of you to really be strict with yourself in just one minute. And there is a little clock there that you can watch. Can you, in one minute, give me any closing statement that you have? And maybe, and this is a topic we haven't yet discussed, also let me know how you see the relationship between global coordination. Because we all know that you know, the risks associated with AI do not stop at the national border, do not stop at the European border. We know that there is a lot going on also in other countries, that some countries also take different approaches. So if you want to, in your closing one minute statement, mention something about that, that would be great. Maybe let's start with uh, Gabriele and uh, go in the other direction this time. Sorry if I caught you by surprise there. Yes, you did. Um, <laughs> I think... Uh, on the global aspect, um, I mean, I can, I can, I can say that um, this is something that has been in our minds for, for since the beginning, and and it's certainly a very complex process. I mean, 
there are tons of people who are engaging with AI at very different levels. And, and, and we're doing our best to sort of create those connections, both at the level of multilateral organizations and at the level of member states. We call it like-minded member states, countries, not only in the EU. Um, and, and that is certainly a very um, resource-intensive and consuming process, but there is, there is no other way around it. And, um, and I think this is even more important as, as AI is not going to be a product like traditional product that is probably produced in one place and sold somewhere else, but it's, it's an evolving product that will continue to cross borders as it ev uh, sort of uh, comes to existence and as it evolves. Mm -hmm. So yesterday there was an interesting talk about liquid AI, which I think it's an interesting concept to, to develop further. Okay, thank you, Gabriel, and thank you very much for the organizers for actually putting a one minute clock here. I think it's great. Stephanie? Um, so uh, I, I'll, I'll focus on the on the international uh, the international aspect perhaps because um, I think my statement has already been summarized in the beginning. Um, how to ensure that we um, are all on the same page with respect to AI regulation? Um, well, legally speaking, I see two options. One of which is I think the preferred one: um, international cooperation. Um, there is already, as already mentioned, a lot of um, cooperation at an international level uh, taking place. Uh, uh, the EU is looking at AI, uh, but we also have other governmental, international governmental organizations which are doing so. Um, one uh, of them, uh, and actually Professor Peggy Valke of our institute is uh, personally involved in it, is the um, Council of the European Union, uh, which is um, considering through the uh, Committee on Artificial Intelligence, um, whether or not it is advisable to have a transversal um, principle-based uh, uh, Oviedo Convention-like uh, treaty um, on artificial intelligence. And um, this is just to give you, to give you one example. Uh, UNESCO is looking at AI, OECD is looking at AI. Um, will we have one international treaty on AI um, between now and the coming two or three years? Probably no. Uh, probably it will be still be very fragmented, but I think that at least these um, different international organizations create fora for discussion, um, which, is, um, which is good to, um, uh, to, foster, to foster alignment. Um, the second option that, uh, that is an option that has already actually been implemented in the GDPR, and there I, I would like to see how it turns out, is uh, giving extraterritorial application to a certain extent, always based on, on, on a principle, on a jurisdiction principle, which will be the effects principle um, of EU legislation. Um, so uh, there, I, there are some people who argue uh, you could go into that direction uh, and it will kind of make sure that other uh, countries will do the same. Um, I see I'm running out of time, but I'm, I, I doubt about the legitimacy of such a, such a European-based um, golden standard. Okay, thank you very much. So, good points indeed. International cooperation under international fora, uh, supranational organizations, and potential extraterritorial application. Norberto, can I have your statement? Uh, yes, and it's kind of nerve-wracking to have this uh, time count. Um, so, international cooperation is absolutely key, given the proliferation of regulatory approaches being uh, suggested for companies, namely the ones operating globally, obviously having a level playing field and predictability of, of how to, to do business is absolutely uh, crucial. Coming back to risk assessment methodology, we even, even, even the, the very own idea of, of risk assessment methodology has been approached differently. If we look at how the German Data Ethics Commission report or the leaked uh, European Commission document is seeing it as a stratified risk assessment methodology for you no know, low risk applications. You have a correspondent, uh, more stringent regulatory requirements for less uh, risky ones. You have less cumbersome or, or less stringent ones. If you look, for example, at the Singapore AI governance model, you actually have a more of a process based way of, of handling risk where you actually would conduct um, a series of, of steps where you would understand what's the probability and severity of damage or risk and from that, that point onwards understand what's the actual risk that is entailed in the AI application which is different from this stratified one. So this is an example of 
you know, very valid ideas around, around risk assessment methodology are actually being framed differently. So having uh, uh, international cooperation might help in understanding the pros and cons of each of those approaches and understanding which one uh, should be guiding, um, guiding industries. Facebook was part of the OECD multi-stakeholder uh, process that led to the OECD AI recommendation. Uh, developed uh, strong AI ethical uh, principles and uh, our hope is that they would be reflected uh, in, uh, um, consistently in the uh, legislation uh, domestically or even internationally. Okay, thank you. So international cooperation also as a means of learning from one another and, and filling some gaps. Fanny. Thank you. For the global aspect, I have two points. First, if you read a document that uses the narrative that the European Union is in a race with China and the US, and it uses this narrative without a critique, you can probably stop reading. And the second is the Trump administration just said and referred to the EU that agencies should promote trustworthy AI and must consider fairness, non-discrimination, openness, transparency, etc. You know if the Trump administration believes that it's an appropriate framework to achieve these objectives, it's your trustworthy AI framework, then you're doing something wrong. That's a powerful closing statement. Thank you, Fanny. Okay, I think we've heard a lot of things. I try to direct it as concretely as possible, but it's difficult because we also hear that there is still a mapping that needs to take place. We hear that we shouldn't rush. We hear that there are already some things that could be done. Um, I'd now like to open up the floor to questions from the audience. Just three golden rules. First, briefly state who you are so that we know who is asking the question. Two, it would be great if you could say who you're addressing your question to. Is it one of the panelists? Is it the entire panel? And three, please, please, please be brief. No monologues, please. All right, we have a first question over there. Um, Michael Veal from University College London. Uh, AI systems transform infrastructure. They transform surveillance cameras into things that can lip read or do facial recognition. They transform Facebook's tracking infrastructure across apps and the web into something that's much more pervasive and, and worrying. Organizations like the High Level Expert Group don't touch upon this issue at all. They miss out the, the way it transforms infrastructure. And, and I would, I'm wondering what the panel think about the need to revisit our regulation of that infrastructure given its transformation, rather than revisit AI that's layered on top of it. I think it was addressed to the entire panel, so who wants to start? And thank you for keeping your questions short. Fanny, go for it. I, I agree with Michael that this should be done. My understanding of AI, as I said, is a basic, a basic means and infrastructure that changes our democratic society's decision-making process, in my view. And when I look at this uh, infrastructure in the hand of certain companies or the Hungarian government where I come from, that's where I have very, very serious doubts that just basic enforcement of existing laws will be enough to address these infrastructural, st structural questions of our societies. Would anyone in the panel like to add on that? Yeah, um, well, not comment on what the, the group should have uh, covered in their ethical guidelines. In, in terms of uh, tackling it from an infrastructure perspective, I thought uh, this was um, covered, at least uh, Stephanie mentioned, doing the mapping not only of the existing regulatory framework, but also of the technology itself. And I think this goes to, to the point that was raised in to what extent is AI uh, changing those technologies or uh, making them more accurate, more effective, uh, and what are the, 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 the concerns, but also the opportunities that that bring to, uh, to, to people. Um, I think from, from a company standpoint, it's important to keep emphasizing um, transparency, uh, doing efforts around explaining how the technology actually works and giving users control over that, over that technology by, by being more clear about the settings and making them more visible, more prominent, um, informing and educating them on, on how to exercise their rights uh, in-app in the platform uh, itself. Okay, thank you. I think we'll go to the next question now. Thank you. My name is uh, Rikke Frank Jørgensen. I'm from the Danish Human Rights Institute. So I would like to touch upon um, 
uh, an element that was also briefly mentioned, namely the notion of personal information. And in this complex information system, I would argue that the notion of, of personal information is, is deeply challenged. And we seem to presume that we know what we talk about when we talk about personal information and that it's a clearly legal demarc demarcated category. While in, in reality, in these systems, practically any information can turn into personal information. And there might be an of unfortunate alliance here, actually, between the Commission and Facebook in keeping the narrative of, of personal information as something that we clearly understand as a protected category. Because from the perspective of the Commission, there's an interest in, in in, in how to say it, in, in arguing that there is this clarity as to what it is, both because we need it legally, even though we maybe don't have it, but also because we can do something with non-personal information that we can't with the personal, which there is also an interest in, the, the whole exchange of the non-personal. And on the side of Facebook, there's also an interest of a more narrow interpretation than what we have in reality. So, my point is we really need to, it's crucial that we, that we um, get more clarity on what do we mean with the notion of personal information and how it's challenged in order to provide through protection, the protection that is intended with the GDPR. Okay, thank you. So, if I formulate that into a question, um, how do you see the notion of personal data challenged? And would you agree with the statement? I think we can maybe summarize it like that. Both the commission and Facebook were uh, envisaged, but if anyone wants to comment thereon, please go ahead. Yeah, just, just briefly, I, 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 I touched upon that point and I totally agree. Um, uh, to a certain extent, of course, we cannot in the law give, um, uh, the law is, is has to be to a certain extent um, vaguely formulated in order to be able to be applied to different situations. But unfortunately, um, with the legal uncertainty that is out there as to how personal data has to be interpreted, um, anything these days could potentially fall under the notion of personal data. This is not what I am arguing, but what some scholars have argued and I'm referring to, for example, the article of um, Nazeda Portova, the law of everything, referring to, to GDPR. This is only one example. So, um, I think very concretely, um, uh, one of the key criteria to define whether or not something is personal data is whether or not a subject is identifiable or not. And there the key question is identifiable to whom? Uh, because if it means that uh, somebody can be identifiable in the future by somebody, uh, so going for an absolute approach, then potentially we risk indeed to have a very, very broad definition of personal data. And I think that the guidance that we have up to now um, is not clear uh, as to what type of approach, whether it is a relative or an absolute one, uh, we should take uh, with respect to personal data. Um, I, I would go for a more relative one, which I think is also represented in GDPR, but we do not have any concrete guidance at the moment from either the ECJ or the National Data Protection or the EDPB authorities that are confirming this. Okay. Thank you. Gabriele, Norberto, I'll ask you to try to be brief because we have at least two more questions waiting, but... Yeah, I, I, I don't have a lot to say on, on this specific question on definition because I, I don't think I'm very qualified to do that. Um, I, I just want to mention um, an idea that I've been um, reading about, but it's actually it's an old concept that I think was, was proposed by someone at the Berkman Klein Center um, in, uh, in, in Harvard about sort of the idea of having um, sort of a, 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 a fiduciary duty of... Uh, certain entities or people holding personal information. So that means that in the case of um, companies having a huge amount of personal information, in that case, they would need to act as if they were fiduciaries of that information. Like, for instance, you go to the doctor. So that doesn't solve the problem of whether this is, uh, what is personal information or what is not. But I think it, it obliges those people who, was, who have certain information can be used in your interest or not against your interest to actually 
use it always in your best interest in a certain sense. Okay, so exploring new models basically. Norberto, very yeah, I, would, I would just uh, expand on, on, on the question saying that the, the challenges posed by AI go way beyond just a definition of personal information. If you, if you look at, uh, you know, foundational principles like the principle of data minimization or purpose specification, th there are clear, clear challenges that are brought by AI and how you actually should responsibly develop AI that kind of stress test those, those principles. Another uh, example would, would be the collection of, of sensitive data. Uh, there, there's an interesting tension between privacy and, and fairness from a privacy perspective and for a very legitimate reasons there's a high threshold of consent to collect that type of data. But if you actually you ask an engineer that wants to do his job and wants to build a machine learning classifier that is, that is not discriminating people, they, that would be a piece of data that would very, be very important to avoid having blind spots and understanding what's the impact of, of that algorithm on, on, um, on race and ethnicity, for, for example. So uh, this is our. So this is the things that we need to to understand is what are uh, what are the stress tests that AI is posing to existing regulatory frameworks and to its foundational principles and how can we reach a more flexible um, arrangement that will allow uh, companies and, and stakeholders in general to build AI in a responsible way. Okay. So more questions that need an answer. Yes. Please. Uh, good morning, everybody. Working. Okay. Uh, good morning, everybody. I'm Silvia Sendari from Orgalim, Europe Technologies Industries. Uh, we all have a shared goal here, to so have trustworthy AI, so that I think we, we can share. My question will be for Gabriele mainly, but of course anybody uh, is welcome to answer. Uh, since Article 22 of GDPR covers automated decision-making, would you think it would be useful to have further guidance documents from the European Data Protection Board on this topic and perhaps also on uh, legitimate interest to create uh, trustworthy AI. Thank you. Gabriele, can you answer that in 30 seconds? Um, again, I, I, because I don't manage the GDPR, so I, I don't think I can give you a very informed uh, opinion here. Um, I, I feel there has been quite a substantive guidance, though, by the uh, uh, Article 29 Working Party. And, and I, again, I think uh, I, I'm very curious to see what the actual implementation uh, in practice of GDPR will look like uh, based on the evaluation of GDPR in, in this year. I think, and based on that, it, it will be seen whether maybe something else will be needed. All right, thank you. We have our last question. Hello, thank you. Um, my name is Chris Holder, technology lawyer based in London. Um, if you can't define what artificial intelligence is, then there's going to be a real problem around how you frame any regulation around this. So I would like to ask the panel what your definition of artificial intelligence is. Thank you. I think we already heard, at least from Fanny, uh, I remember uh, an alternative suggestion, but if you can all have your last 30 seconds uh, of closure answering that question, I think that would be a nice way to end the panel on AI regulation, actually. Fanny? Yes, what I, what I recommend from a legislative perspective and scooping is to focus on the automated decision-making systems instead of AI or defining AI. And, uh, and uh, also I, I support the approach of, uh, of for focusing on the impact and to ensure rights-based approach and human rights respecting frameworks. Um, as a, I think in terms of the definition of AI, I would just second what we said about focusing on, on the effects. Uh, and in terms of definition, it's difficult to come up with, with one in, in 30 seconds, having also my concluding remarks. Um, just to finish, I, and one last idea is to be, um, to match techno technology, technological innovation with regulatory innovation. Uh, there are many different paths towards regulating technology that can be explored and what is interesting nowadays is to actually be able to come up with a way to test them. Uh, there, are, there is this idea that is speaking of a lot of momentum uh, around regulatory sandbox in, in AI. They've been referenced in a number of national AI strategies. They've ac actually been mandated in some legal uh, provisions. Just look at the, um, the personal data protection um, law in, in India that was introduced in Parliament that has a specific provision on regulatory sandbox for new and emerging technologies that includes AI. Uh, so one idea is to be 
uh, creative and uh, precise on, on what those testing, those safe ground experimentation platforms can look like and in, in what way can them help inform legislators, regulators to come up with, uh, with the most uh, appropriate uh, balanced uh, regulation legislation on AI. Thank you. Stephanie. I, um, I think I will refer to two elements that are very um, often discussed in relation to AI, um, which are one, the um, autonomy. Uh, uh, AI systems are systems that, can, that have a certain amount of autonomy, so they can um, produce output, uh, take decisions without any human intervention or constant human intervention. Uh, this is something that I would look at as a regulator, to which extent um, are we really looking at technology that um, basically renders the human obsolete? that is able to produce effects that have, um, to produce output that have an effect on the individual without any individual having been um, involved in the process. And then a second element that I would, that I would look at is a self-learning capacity of, um, of, of the AI systems that are out there today and that distinguish the AI systems that were maybe um, that were popular in the 1950s. So the, the, the fact that there is there are no pre-programmed, they learn by themselves to a certain extent, because again, it all depends on, on, on the system. Uh, it, it's all on a spectrum. Um, but so to the extent that AI systems learn by themselves, um, this could challenge our notion of, uh, of, 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 of predictability. They could behave in a way that we could not predict. Um, and if we couple that with the fact that there is no human in the decision making, this could mean that we lose control. Um, I have to stop you there because we're already running over time, but I think it's very helpful to point out the distinguishing elements of, let's say, more modern uh, approaches of AI. Gabriele, last but not least. Um, so this is certainly a a very critical question. We've been thinking about it a lot, and we are very glad that uh, the high-level expert group has done some work on it, so they actually came up with a definitional document of AI, which I would encourage everybody to look at. Um, uh, but from a regulatory perspective, um, indeed, the, the goal should be to create, to, to define AI in a way that is, first of all, future-proof, given that it's not easy to amend legislation, it takes a lot of time. And from my perspective, personal perspective, should be as broad as possible. Also because AI is a concept that has been shifting over the years. Now, for instance, like symbolic AI is sort of uh, a more rule-based system approach where one can wonder, is this still AI or not, given the fact that now we have other technologies and techniques. Um, the point being that even if one takes a broad approach in terms of defini defining AI, that doesn't mean that the regulatory framework will apply to all of that. I mean, the point when you structure a regulation, you have the definitions, but then you have other provisions, like for instance, on the scope or, or the actual obligations, which can narrow down the, the, the legal impact of a certain regulation. Okay. But it's easier to amend rather than to create a completely new regulation based on a new definition. Okay, thank you. That is clear. Um, thank you very much for all of you who have been following this panel. I think we've heard a lot of interesting things, uh, and it seems that at least when we say at a high level, there seems to be a lot of agreement, but it seems that when we go to more concrete level, there are still some things to flush on out, and also some work that lies ahead for the European Commission. I'm going to run to the other panel now in the other building, and it was a pleasure to be here with you. Thank you. <laughs>